Boone Lake is only a lake bed now. They drained it years ago. Weeds, grass, small trees, and shrubs have taken the place of the water. When the wind blows, the foliage ripples like waves. Boats and docks sit among the growth like tombstones. Grim reminders to the past fun and beauty of the place. If you're out there in high summer, and if you listen closely, you can still hear the faint ring of laughter, the distant buzzing hum of outboard motors, and water lapping gently at the banks. Echoes of the past linger in places like Boone Lake, places that were once hubs of activity, places that harbored so much life. My family owned a house out there when I was a kid. It was an older house, having been built by my great-grandfather sometime around 1910. The house had been passed down through the family ever since, just the way Grandpa had wanted. Summer evenings, sitting on the dock, the sun setting low in the west, and at first setting, the world blazed with oranges and reds, and then casting everything into darkness. That was my favorite time, watching the shadows grow longer and darker, creeping along and eating the daylight world. My friends and I spent many nights sitting around the fire on that little lip of sandy beach owned by my family. It wasn't much of a beach, but it was big enough for us boys to build a fire around which we could sit at and tell stories. Mostly they were ghost stories. And sometimes we would talk about girls, too. Especially when we got older and entered high school. Adolescence wasn't kind to any of us, though. And we found ourselves consumed by the constant struggle to fit in. To belong. To be part of the group. And none of us ever achieved the status of being awesome, but we did reach the echelon of being cool. At least for a while. I had my books in the lake house. And that was enough for me. And by our junior year, I had given up on climbing that social ladder any higher. I sat on the dock and fished or read my horror books and magazines. Love of reading wasn't the only reason I spent so many hours peering down at the pages of my books. I wanted to be a writer. To be a good writer, too. I would have to invest time in writing first. Not just my beloved horror, but other genres as well. This was elementary wisdom to me, but if I had a choice between Little Woman and Cujo, well, then I would read Cujo. I had a job at the local hardware store that year too. I was a good employee, quiet, efficient, always on time. I can't say that I liked the job, but, well, I didn't hate it either. It was a job and it supplied the money I needed to buy my first car. That was also good enough for me. I had adopted a go-with-the-flow attitude. Now, maybe I was lazy. I'm not sure. I didn't feel like I was being lazy. I was just content. I saw no reason to rail against my place in the unspoken caste system going on. Why get an ulcer over it? Just be who you are and make the best of your life. Now, my parents were the exact opposite, always struggling to keep up with the Joneses, as the saying goes. It worried my mother right to an early grave during my junior year of high school. My father joined her shortly after I graduated. During the hardest part of my young life, I inherited the family home, 40 acres, Enough money to live on for the rest of my life if I wasn't frivolous, and I got the lake house. With no clue what to do with any of it, I floundered. I quit my job at the hardware store and cloistered myself in the lake house. And each day I drifted from room to room, bemoaning my heartache and grief. Becoming a master at avoiding any activity that might draw me out of the house. I remained isolated for weeks at a stretch. The bills were all set up to be automatically paid from the bank account, as was the grocery delivery service. I had a four-week rotating shopping list of items, mostly frozen dinners, you know, the cheap kind loved by little kids throughout the country. 
and this menu was supplemented only by small amounts of food that required actual cooking on my part. Now after a few months of this, my friends, Bill and Teague, showed up unannounced during the middle of my daily afternoon nap. Waking to their loud knocks at the front door, I was momentarily confused. It wasn't grocery delivery day, nobody should be knocking. Now my first thought was to send them away. I knew better. They would become more insistent. Opening the door, I smiled at them, and their twin expressions of shock and horror made me stop. Had I answered the door naked? I looked down just to be sure. No. Ooh. I was in my nightclothes and wore my father's ragged housecoat and slippers. They fought to change their expressions when they finally recovered, and I invited them inside. Teague was the first to mention my extreme weight loss. I had lost 40 pounds. I hadn't had that much to spare, and I knew I looked scrawny compared to before. It wasn't like I had tried to lose the weight. I mean, it just happened. They only stayed for a little while, and quite honestly, I was glad. I wanted to continue with my nap. And that was the first time something strange happened in the lake house. Yawning loudly, I stretched as I shuffled toward the sofa. And from the corner of my eye, I saw movement and jerked in that direction. A woman stood between the kitchen and my den. She was striking. Her long raven hair was wet and hanging far below her shoulders. She wore a bathing suit, likes of which I had only ever seen in photos of women in the early 1950s. She was staring at me and dripping water all over the parquet flooring. And at that moment, I opened my mouth to ask who the hell she was. She was gone. She disappeared in the length of time it took me to blink and draw a breath. A chill worked its way through the house twined around me and moved on as if it were alive and suddenly i wanted to be outside out of the dim house and out in the sunlight instead i forced my feet to take me to the spot where the woman had dripped water there was nothing except the floor it needed a good sweeping and mopping but there was no sign of the girl naturally i checked the house to make sure no one was in there to see that the windows and doors were secure. And with my mind partially at ease, I flipped on the television. My afternoon nap had been successfully ended. Now a few days passed without incident. I relaxed again and happily wafted down into my own depression. And I guess it was more of a funk instead of a depression. And realizing that I had to do something constructive with my time, I ventured into the musty attic and retrieved an old royal typewriter that had belonged to my mother. Memories of her sitting at her little writing desk by the living room window, typing out her journal entries, just brought a heaviness to my heart. I was the last of my dad's family, and my mom's sister lived in New Zealand, having followed her husband there 20 years ago. I was alone. I mean, of course, I could have invited friends over or joined them on outings, but, you know, I was content. I was just going with it, riding out the waves of sadness. It would surely end soon enough on its own. And they say time heals all the wounds, and even though I didn't know exactly who they were, well, it sounded like wisdom to me. Now walking down the stairs, lugging the heavy typewriter and thinking about finding ink ribbons for it, I saw her again. The same woman as before. She was dripping wet again and pointing silently at the stairs below me. I froze in mid-stride and willed my eyes not to blink. Who are you? I asked. Her answer was to stare at me and continue pointing at the stairs. When I blinked, she was gone just like before. 
I rushed to where I'd seen her pointing and searched the stairs. Nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, was I losing my goddamn mind? Was she an apparition or just a figment of my imagination? The chilled air spiraled around me again as I stepped from the stairs. In the air movement, I was sure I heard a faint female voice whisper something. Twenty minutes later, I parked in front of a small antique shop. Gus, the owner and operator, often ordered hard-to-find accessories for antiques such as plates for tintype cameras, 35mm film, projector bulbs, and hopefully, royal typewriter ribbons. Gus gawked at me as I stood there in my rumpled nightclothes, my hair a mess, and surely looking as if I'd seen a ghost. I told him what I needed, and he nodded slowly, eyeing me up and down again. He flipped through a Rolodex and then wrote something down. How soon you want these, and, well, how many do you want? He stuck the pencil behind his ear. As soon as possible, please, and I want ten. I need to make sure I've got plenty so I don't have to bother you every week for another ribbon. Nodding again, Gus began to peck at his computer's keyboard. It was a painfully slow process to watch. I mean, not that I was in a hurry to get back home. So, you the tailor boy that lives out there on that lake? Gus didn't look up. Yes, sir. Well, you look like your granddaddy. I'm well, sorry to hear about your parents passing so close together like that. He kept pecking away at the keyboard. Thanks. I turned my attention to the antiques on the overstuffed shelves to avoid more conversation. Gus spoke louder and talked anyway. He told me that he and my grandfather had been acquaintances. He said Grandpa changed after he inherited the house and moved in permanently. He took a wife and had two boys with her, and I assured him that I knew the story. One of the boys was my dad, after all. So, you know about the old man going off his rocker? Woo, that was some scandal around these parts. He chuckled. Um, no. I didn't know he went crazy. Uh, why would you say that? Now, I was starting to become angry at this. Well, I mean, maybe he didn't go crazy, son. Maybe he was always crazy. Ah, at least that's my thoughts. Uh, the man was never quite right in the head. Uh, ask any of the women around my age who lived here long enough to remember him. Uh, most of them were scared to be around him. Rumor was that he... Well, <laughs> rumors ain't nothing to be passing around after all these years. Gus finished pecking at the keyboard and printed off the paper. What rumor? I wanted to know. Laughing, he shook his head and handed me the paper. <sighs> Listen, you gotta overlook me, son. I get mighty forgetful of my manners sometimes. Here, with all the shipping and other charges, it's going to be uh, one sixty-nine and eighty-two cents. I went to the car and pulled my wallet from the glove box. As I paid him. I wanted to punch that goofy backwards grin off of his face. It was rude to give someone just a hint of something and then not finish telling them the story, especially when it was about their family. I had been considering selling the lake house and the family home and moving away from the Boone Lake community completely, and after my dealings with Gus, I considered it more seriously. Back at the house, I walked in, still upset about the story Gus had only partially told me. Flinging the door shut behind me, I set the typewriter on the foyer table and looked up. The same ghostly woman was standing by the newel post, her hand on the front of it about halfway down. She looked up at me and back to the post. She sobbed and disappeared. I braced for the swirl of cold air that always engulfed me when she disappeared. But it didn't happen, and after a few moments, I walked towards the stairs, 
toward that null post she had been so interested in. It just looked like a null post. Nothing remarkable about it. Then I rapped on it with my knuckles. It was hollow. There were no seams. To look at it, I only saw what seemed to be a solid piece of wood. So, I grabbed a small hammer from the kitchen junk drawer and tapped it against the post. It was definitely hollow. With my curiosity piqued, I decided to remove the post and looked inside, find out what the ghost woman was so interested in. I still thought I might be going nuts. I mean, hell, Gus had told me that my grandfather had gone crazy when he lived in the house. Things like that are sometimes hereditary. Nevertheless, I took the post down, and to my surprise, the piece of wood that plugged the hole in the bottom fell out easily when I finally tipped the post onto its side, and something inside rattled. Thinking that perhaps my grandfather, or even my great-grandfather, had hidden money, jewels, or any number of treasures inside, I used the flashlight on my cell phone to peer into the hollow. Bones. There were bones inside the post. Disgusted and frightened, I scooted back, kicking the post away from me. The ghostly woman appeared right before my face. Her looks had changed considerably. Instead of beautiful, she was hideous. Her skin had partially rotted away, and flaps of her face hung loose and seemed to be floating in water. Her hair floated around her, as if it were also in water. Then, I was drowning. The ghost woman held me under the water as I struggled to breathe. I fought with her, confused and terrified. Where was the water coming from? I was sitting on the floor by the stairs, and then I was underwater. And then two more women, resembling the first, appeared and helped to hold me down until I had no choice but to draw water into my lungs. And the woman floated backward, away from me. My body convulsed and began to go numb. My eyes drifted shut. I was dying. And then all of a sudden, I no longer felt the pressure on my body from the water, and I opened my eyes. I was sitting on the floor facing the stairs, retching violently. I lose the flood of water from my lungs. I was soaking wet from head to toe. A whisper so low that I barely heard it came from underneath the stairs. Free us. Now there had never been a door for the empty space under the stairs, and I never thought that was odd until that moment. Who wouldn't want to utilize that space? I took up the hammer, filled with a sense of urgency, and moved toward the spot where I thought there should, logically, have been a door and I began swinging the hammer with all my strength. Those three women needed help. Although they were dead, they had asked me for help, and with each blow of the hammer, I had a flash-shot memory from their lives. By the time I had a hole big enough to crawl through, I was crying. The women had all been very young when their lives were taken from them. My grandfather had drowned each one and stored the bodies underwater until their flesh was mostly gone. He stored them under our dock. The same one my friends and I used to lounge on when we were kids. And once he removed the bodies from the water, he boiled the remaining flesh from them in a zinc tub filled with water over fire and then scraped away the debris. The best I could figure... He put the thigh bones inside the risers of the stairs, and on each thigh bone was etched the initials of the girl's name and the year she was killed. In the storage space, I found three complete skeletons sitting in a neat row against the back wall. There were other bones piled up near underneath the sides of the stairs. And how many girls had my grandfather killed? Well, I don't know. Seeing the bones was more than I could handle, those skeletons with their blind, eyeless sockets staring at me, accusing me, tore at my heart. Backing out of the storage space, I dialed 911. I don't own the lake house anymore, 
I had it demolished and sold the property after all the bones were removed. My grandfather had put the bones of 15 young women inside the stairs, handrail, newel posts, and storage space. Hell, even under the floorboards of the master bedroom. It took months for all the evidence to be sorted out and compiled. Several cold cases were put to rest with a mountain of evidence. As soon as the cops gave me the okay, I got rid of the house. I sold the family home and all the property too. And I've tried to move on from the terror of the incident and to distance myself from my grandfather's name. I even changed my name. I'm Toby now, a writer who lives by Watuga Lake. A solitary man who likes his privacy and sometimes likes to watch the pretty girls swimming down by the boathouse. <laughs>